Okay, welcome back. So we are looking at the aspect of the local church, the bride. Uh, we looked at how in the book of Hosea, uh, the picture of a husband and a bride, the husband being God and the bride being Israel. And in the, in the new covenant, the husband being Jesus and the bride being the local church. Okay. Uh, if we go on, we see a lot of um, examples from the Old Testament itself. Your maker is your husband in Isaiah chapter 54, verse 4 onwards. Um, let's get to the New Testament, the parable of the ten virgins. Now, again, this parable is a picture of the bride coming, right? Uh, the Lord Jesus uses Jewish wedding as an illustration to convey to us the importance of being prepared and ready, expecting his coming, right? Uh, and the church is to await his coming in a state of preparedness, readiness, expectation, and endurance. You and I, as a church, we prepare, in a, we, we are, as a local church, we are in a state of preparedness, readiness, expectation, and endurance. Then we see the chaste version in second, sorry, chaste virgin in second Corinthians 11, 12. For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Now the apostle Paul pictured his ministry by the spirit as presenting the church as a virgin to Christ, the bridegroom of God. Now, we know that the Apostle Paul has done a lot, right? He went about his missionary journeys, planting all of these local churches. Now, one thing that he had in mind is he wanted to, uh, let me just picture it this way. You know, in a, in a wedding ceremony, the father usually comes with the bride. If not the father, maybe the closest to the father, walks in with the bride, right? And the bride, at one point of the wedding, the bride hands over, sorry, the father hands over the bride's hand to the, uh, to the person, to the man who she's getting married to. Now, it, it looks like a picture of something similar to that. The Apostle Paul is saying the ministry that he's doing, the churches that he planted, he wanted it, his vision was to make it as a chaste virgin. That means not somebody that's used up, a virgin, right? And presenting it to the, as a bride to the Lord Jesus. That's just a picture for us to understand, right? He's wooing his bride unto himself with tender love and affection, drawing her to a place of intimacy. It was only like Paul is saying, I, I, I betrothed you to the one husband that I may present you as a virgin, that you as a local church, don't go away. Don't go away from the things of God. Don't fall into sin. But that I may present you spotless in, in, uh, to Christ. <clears throat> then we see Paul is writing about a glorious church. right? Christ's relationship with the church. There's a whole passage there in Ephesians 5, 22 and 32. Uh, 22 to 32. And um, he's talking about a relationship between a man and a woman. Uh, that's why a man should leave, sorry, a woman should leave and they should cleave and become one. So he's talking about this relationship and he's saying Christ's relationship with the church is compared to a husband's relationship to a wife. What Jesus does for the church, he sanctifies and cleanses the church with his word. Now, here's the thing. It is sad to see that there are churches around us, around the globe, which draw thousands of people, mega churches, but the word is not being preached. Recently, somebody sent me a clip. In that clip, the pastors are on the stage. I don't know why they send me these, just to make me upset. These pastors are on the stage. And they have made, they were, you know, they were wearing these football jerseys. You, you know, these the American football, right? These football jerseys. And somebody is holding a Bible. And the pastor comes and kicks it. 
so now i thought to myself now these are not uh, 100 200 people these are mega churches 5000 and above what preaching is happening now i'm not saying it's happening everywhere but it's very important to realize that as a bride the lord jesus sanctifies uh, the lord jesus sanctifies and cleanses the bride with his word if i go to church and if i'm not preaching the word the people there are going to come they're going to sit they're going to listen to some you know just some message or whatever they listen to there's not going to be cleansing there's not going to be sanctification it is the word that sanctifies us it is the word that cleanses us the word is like water it just purifies us now if i just say a feel good message what will happen they all will go back right and they'll do whatever they feel like doing doesn't work that way we need to be preaching the word too the Lord Jesus, He is working on making her glory, making her a glorious church without blemish, perfect, and holiness. Now, the Lord is working. See, God is not giving us a task. He's not saying you will be a glorious church. No. He's saying, I will make you a glorious church, right? And I will give you, I'm giving you the, the weapons that you need. I'm giving you everything that you need, the Holy Spirit, but I will work with you to make you a glorious church. That's so powerful, right? God is working with us. The Lord Jesus is working in us because he knows in our own strength, we cannot be cleansed on our own. Right? He need, we need the blood of Jesus. We need the word of God. Three, he nourishes and cherishes the church. What is the meaning of nourish? When we eat food, what does it do? Nourishes our body. We gain the strength that we need, right? Uh, when we pour water to the plants, it's like nourishment to the plants, right? And then we cherish what we see. Example, you know, I'll just, just a couple of days back, we were looking at some, some of the pictures of my little boys, right? And sometimes, we, you know, when we look at these pictures, say, oh, man, I remember those days. You know, one was two years old, jumping all over the place and, or even when they were you know little babies how oh, we had to handle them with care and now you look at them oh you become so big you cherish them wow you're going to school on your own you're doing your homework there was a time you know you were small sitting in one cradle running around in the house now you become so big you nourish your children and then you cherish them the lord jesus nourishes us as a church through his word through the holy spirit and he cherishes us he cares for us he loves us and i always wonder when the lord jesus sees these kind of places where the word of god is not being taught where all kinds of foolishness is happening in the church it breaks his heart it breaks his heart but the lord jesus will has his way Righteousness and justice are the foundations of his throne. He knows what he must do. Right? But we are responsible also as a church. We are responsible to do things the right way. Next one. The bride has made herself ready. In the book of Revelations, we see it. Uh, the Apostle John sees the great marriage supper, the wedding supper of the Lamb. When the bridegroom God will be married forever with his redeemed saints. Okay, let me give you a picture of what's happening here. We read it in the end times. The rapture happens. We go to heaven. We stand in the judgment seat of Christ. The believers, we stand there. We give an account of our lives. It's a judgment of rewards. Uh, our works are tested by fire. And then we are with Jesus. Right? We get glorified bodies. We are with Jesus. We are there. Now, in the meanwhile, here on earth is the seven-year tribulation and all. Towards the end of the seven year, somewhere during that time will be the marriage supper of the Lamb. That means the Lord Jesus, you know, it's not going to be a real supper, but it's going to be a place where these believers are washed by the blood of Jesus, clothed in his garments of righteousness, and we are walking righteous. It's like we're all celebrating a wedding ceremony that's happened. Right? And then immediately after that, 
your Lord Jesus will come from heaven with the saints, with all of us, for the uh, battle of Armageddon. Right? So here he's saying, the bride has made herself ready. The Lord Jesus, we will sit with him as a bride, ready. Okay, next one. The spirit and the bride. Revelations 22, 17 says, And the spirit and the bride say, Come. The Holy Spirit has en been entrusted with the work of preparing the bride for the groom. See that? Now, in the natural, what does the bride do? They go to the closest or the best beauty parlor. Do what they have to do. You know, somebody said it's just an innocent form of disfigurement. They go to the beauty parlor, they get all touched up, and they come. Now, for us, the Holy Spirit is coming, has been entrusted with the work to prepare the bride. The Holy Spirit is there among us. Now, we don't see Jesus, right? Do we see Jesus in the church physically? We don't see Jesus, right? But the Holy Spirit is there, and he's working in people's lives. Preparing them to be the bride. So as the bride, we must be in alignment and unity with the Holy Spirit, hearing, saying, doing what He desires and what He work and how He works among us, through us, uh, to prepare us for, to be this bride. You understand what's happening here? The Holy Spirit. God the Father has entrusted the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, now you look after the church. These believers, you have to look after them and make them a spotless bride because I'm going to send my son and Jesus is going to come and they're going to be betrothed together. You see the picture here? Three things are happening. Then, the bride and the groom. Our relationship with our Lord in many ways, has been def defined by the relationship of a bride to a groom. What is that relationship? Just look, look at a few things here. The bride is lost in her love, ad admiration, commitment to her groom. Right? She is totally in love, desperate love. She sings songs of love. Now, remember, we are not looking at it in the natural. We are not looking at it in a, uh, in a love that is what we see here in the natural. This is a, a, a agape love, the God kind of love. Right? And you and I, as his bride, we must be lost in his love, in his admi in, in admiration, in commitment to the groom. Right? That's our responsibility. The, as a bride, we are lost in him. Next one. Again, see, there's a, there's a guideline here. Women are not to interpret this understanding in a fleshly, fleshly way of romancing Jesus as though he was their natural lover. Now, that's not a possibility at all, but sadly, there are times people may think of it that way. Women need to be very careful. For men, uh, that it is not that we lose our natural masculinity. It's not like, uh, you know, hey, as a man, how can I love Jesus? He was also a man. No, we're not thinking of it in the natural, in a spiritual sense. We are in love. We are in commitment to Jesus. Then the bride adorns herself in what would please her groom so that she can present herself in her best for the groom. Church is therefore not about us and what pleases us, Church is about what pleases Jesus. Am I doing what I'm doing in the right way so that I can please Jesus in the church? That's our desire. Now, we must also understand that the Holy Spirit given to us, and he's given us the spirit of wisdom and revelation, and there's a lot of things that we have to do in the natural. For example, uh, you know, we talked about it in initially, right? Uh, your, your church, you're planting a church. You don't need to pray and ask the, uh, Jesus, Jesus, should I uh, appoint an uh, assistant pastor? Now, of course, this prayer is needed, but this is a common thing. You have to do it. 
you need other leaders you can't pray you don't have to pray and say oh, god i do i have to prepare leaders no in the natural we have to do right we have to do what we have to do we don't say okay let jesus do everything no church is not about us impressing and looking good before one another church is about being pleasing in god's eyes the bride is the recipient of the groom's unconditional love you and i as a bride are the recipient that means we receive the unconditional love of jesus what do you mean by this unconditional love perfect example would be the parable of the lost son that's called unconditional love unconditional there were no conditions placed when he came back after squandering all the money all the wealth the father said my son was lost but now he's found let's celebrate the father didn't say you've squandered all your all the money i told you it was better off in my hands you come back because you have no other place to go now this is what the now you'll have to go and work until you pay back all the money you go and work the love was unconditional the lord jesus the same way loves us as a church unconditionally let me give you this example is it important to pray if we don't pray do will god love us is it important to spend time reading god's word if we don't read god's word will god love us that's what that's what it is it's unconditional there's no conditions placed now the reason why we pray the reason why we read god's word is because we want to be that spotless bride god is not saying when we go up to heaven god is not saying see i gave you the bible with 10 different versions not even once you finish the the bible he's not going to ask all that there's no conditions to that love we're not going by works you understand what i'm saying right we are going by the grace of through faith grace of god through the blood of jesus we are entering his presence rewards are different we're all saved the same way right so the local church is a place where we receive god's unconditional love i may run away from god i don't all of this Five years later, if I come back, God's love remains the same. In fact, He may love me even more. Oh, He ran away; He's come back now. His love is the same, or greater. You understand, right? So, His love as a local church is unconditional. Fourthly, the bride has access to the groom's heart, which is a place of intimacy. The bride has access. You and I have access to the Father. Paul sorry John writes it so beautifully Paul writes it in the book of Romans through his spirit we cry out we do not receive the spirit of of slavery but we receive the spirit of sonship that through that spirit we call out of our father we can know the father's heart through the holy spirit what does it say the holy spirit will reveal the will of the father to you that's what he will do so we have access fifthly the bride keeps herself for the groom she does not settle for any other man i think of this in the natural if a if a man if a bride right uh, goes to with another man that's what the book of hosea is all about right hosea calls gomer and says listen stop what you're doing come I'll give you a home. I'll give you a respectable position. You can be a house. You can when people when you go out, people will begin to respect you because you're a woman in the house. You're married to a prophet. You'll have some kind of name. Stop what you're doing. She says, "Okay, she comes." But then, husband is gone. Oh, what well, this is boring. This is not what I want to do. Go back to prostitution. again god says go and bring her back now imagine hosea how she how he is feeling out of all of them the old testament says it's a, it's it's a big sin it's one of the seven deadly sins committing adultery be stoned to death but god is telling hosea go and bring them back bring her back bring her back to the house 
I see this is the picture of, of, of the bride going away, but you and I must settle for no other, no other, no other bride. Meaning we must not look up, look at other gods, look at other people who claim to be gods, right? Our eyes must be fixed on Jesus. He must be kept pure and we must be holy, uh, washed by the word. We are cleansed or sanctified because of his love. Next one. We are called to be like a bride getting ready for, the, for her marriage to a groom. So she waits expectantly, a, sec, a sense of expectation, a sense of with endurance, readiness, preparedness must grip our hearts. Right? So you know, most of us are unmarried here. So you know, the moment you have decided your marriage, gone. You keep thinking of that. You'll never forget that day. Right? And the rest of your life is the day you will remember. It's something that you look forward to. It's something that you expect with endurance. You plan, you prepare for that. Now Look at it in the natural, right? If you know your wedding is on in the month of December, December 1st, when will you start preparing? Will you go November 15th or November 20th and say, I want to do decoration. I want to do a stage. Will you do that 15 days before? Nowadays, at least two, three months before, we have our premarital course in APC. It's six months before. So if a person, if a couple wants to get married at APC, six months prior to marriage, they should tell us. And they work with the chrysalis team. Sometimes they work with the pastoral team. Six months of counseling. Only then we can get them married. Preparation. It's important. They need it. Right? Now, seventh one. When we serve the body of Christ, we are serving the bride of Christ. A people from whom God loves unconditionally. A people in whom he delights as his bride. A people whom he is married to. All ministry, including intercession, must flow out of this understanding. When we serve in the body of Christ, we are also to serve unconditionally. Let me say this. We are to love everyone within the body of Christ. Now, now, this love doesn't mean I don't discipline. I want you to hear me very carefully. God is saying, I love you unconditionally. So when we, as in, in a church, in ministry, we have to love everyone. Now, just because I have to love everyone, it doesn't mean I don't discipline anyone. If I love my children, I better discipline them. Otherwise, I'll have two clowns in my house. God in the Old Testament loved the people of Israel, but he had to discipline them. They were going all over the place. So, as a body, you and I must flow out of this understanding. That we need to walk in love, yet we need to also bring discipline, bring order. In the body of Christ. Okay? If I love somebody, I cannot choose leaders because I love them. You get what I'm saying? Right? Hey, this person is very good. Uh, you know, he's very good. So, because I love him, I'll make him a leader. No. Is he or she equipped enough to lead that ministry? Oh, this person is very good. You know, when I went to his house, they gave me good food to eat. So, I'll make him the or uh, no life group leader. I cannot say that. Is he or she equipped? Now, when I say no, as leaders, when we say no, doesn't mean we don't love them. It's just that, you know, it's, you're not ready yet, or this is not the time yet. You've got to wait. So, when we do ministry, we, there will be times we have to make these difficult decisions, but we have to make it for the sake of the body of Christ, right? Now, Practical ways how we can implement this. Encourage people to become passionate lovers and worshippers of the Lord. The moment you love God and you do ministry or you're doing local church, 
It's an overflow. You don't have to do anything, right? It's just an overflow of love. Teach people that everything we do is unto the Lord. Teach ministers that all ministry must flow out of this understanding that we are, uh, you know, uh, we are preparing a bride for the bridegroom. And that's why we have uh, conferences like Kingdom Builders. Most of, most of the time we go uh, to other places and teach these truths of God's word. Yes, there are local churches all across our nation, all across the world. There are local churches. But the bigger picture is not the local church. The bigger picture is we are the bride of Christ. So until we teach it, sometimes they, that understanding may not come. Right? And so that's why we have kingdom builders, trainings, teachings for pastors, leaders all across our nation. And then we be sensitive to the moving of the Holy Spirit. We must flow with the seasons the Spirit is leading us as a congregation. Right? Uh, there will be seasons where he'll make us wait. There will be seasons of outpouring. There will be seasons of great anointing and great miracles. There will be seasons of great learning in the word. Right? Uh, so there will be different kinds of seasons. So we learn to journey along with the Holy Spirit. But in all of this, remember that he's cleansing us. He's preparing us. Right? So think of this. I think the end times series, we, this is... I think it's the second time, because I remember preaching it before. This is the second time we're covering end times. But there's a lot of sermon series that we're repeating. Right? We repeat again and again. Now, why do we do that? Because it's cleansing. Do you have bath once and then after that, uh, after two weeks? No, I had bath, no, so after two weeks I'll have again. Do we do that? Every day we get up, we have bath. The same way, the word of God, you listen to the same sermon 10 times also, God can minister to you in 10 different ways all the 10 times. But there's a cleansing also happening inside us. Right? So be sensitive to the moving of the Holy Spirit. What are some of the challenges we may face? We need to balance both the come and the go. Meaning, we, the local church and body enjoys the come meaning many people coming into church we are nurturing them we are a family we love them we care for them we teach them we are looking to be the body of christ and then we forget the principle of going what did jesus say go and make disciples so then we need to balance it as people are coming in you have people you know you have a team of leaders people who are helping them grow but you also have you're also outward focused go to make disciples, right? Then there can be people who are more inclined to enjoy the waiting or who are more inclined to enjoy waiting on the Lord while the others are more inclined to go and gather the harvest. Now, yeah, you, you understand what's happening here? Some believers may say, hey, I'm waiting on the Lord. I'm just waiting for the Lord's coming, the rapture. So I'm going to trust God. I'm just waiting eagerly. I'm going to live a holy life. I'm going to be pure. I'm going to read my word, pray, uh, declare God's word over my life. Just make sure that the enemy doesn't have any foothold in my life. And there's another group of people said, hey, whatever we know, we need to go tell others also. So let's go out, gather the harvest. Now, so you have two kinds of people. Now, both are not wrong. And both are right. But we need to balance it. Balance is very important. If I only work and don't sleep and rest, what will happen? What will happen to me? I will go into some kind of a stage where I won't be able to do anything. I need to be able to rest so that I can do good ministry. If I have a vision to do ministry till I'm 70 years old, what must I do now at 38? Firstly, stop drinking so much coffee. And I got to eat healthy. I got to go exercise. I got to do some things in the natural. I can't say, Lord, till 70, give me. There is a responsibility that we have. Right? So I got to balance it up. 
I, I exercise, I eat healthy, and I say, God, thank you for healing my body. If I don't eat and I don't exercise and say, God, thank you for healing my body, God will say, go first, eat well. I've given you everything, right? I've given you all what you want to eat. What do you need? You can buy and eat. No, do it. I've given you time. Make time for exercise. You don't want to exercise. You only want to sit in one place. What will happen? What happens when you sit in one place? There's no energy. There's no uh, physical activity. No. So there's our responsibility and there's God's. Right? So we balance it. Okay. Any other questions before we go into the next chapter? Uh, point number five. Yeah. Page 126. Mm. Now it says the bride keeps herself for the groom. Mm. She does not settle for any other man. So for us in this context, is it a reference to only idolatry? One. And the second question is, uh, when it says uh, the brief of it, like, you know, Christ is coming for a bride who will be without spot or wrinkle. So we are already tamed and yeah. uh, rusted yeah. with the sin and the thing. So is it reference to after we've come to the Christ where we have uh, kept ourselves holy and pure? So I would say, see, look at it this way. If as a local church, I've become a believer. Okay? You and I are believers. I believe in Jesus, believe everything. But I continue sinning or I... I continue to do things other than, you know, spending time in God's word. Maybe it could be small things, gossip. It could be spending too much time on TV or, you know, uh, too, too much of video games. I'm not talking about big sins. I'm talking about small things that can take us away, right? Um, it could be jealousy, pride, small things like this. What is happening? We are spotted there, right? But it's it's not like... Jesus is saying, okay, you, because of this, I'll not, you're not a spotless bride. No. He is going to cleanse us. Right? Through his blood, he's going to make us a spotless bride. Right? He will cleanse us all. But the point here is, we need to keep ourselves pure. Right? Now, if I, I say, okay, Jesus is Lord and Savior over my life. As Lord and Savior, he, the Lord Jesus, whatever he says, I must do. Okay. Now he says, Paul, I want you to, you know, for example, right? I want you to read every day, just read for the word for one hour. Right? It's a simple thing. But if I decide, say, hey, but one hour, and two hours I'm able to spend on the phone or doing uh, watching something which is not helping me out. Now what's happening is, see, God, the Lord Jesus wants to do something. But I'm not partnering with him. Remember, we are, we are partners with him. So I need to learn to partner with him. Uh, now, what's happening is I'm give, making this to us. I'm, I'm, I'm not letting Jesus be the Lord and Savior. Because he wants me to do something, but I'm, let, I'm doing something else. Right? So there's a path that we must take. Of course, other gods that we don't do. Like you and I as believers, we're not going to go and worship another god. But idolatry is not always means a physical idol, right? It could be anything in our life. I'm speaking to a couple of... Now, I'm not bringing anyone down. These are some young people. They're not from our, our church, but just some young believers that I know of. And they were, we were talking to them, and he was telling me, I've watched the entire series of some, I don't know, uh, now this Netflix something is there. Ten seasons of some series where they, uh, you know, the mind reading, I forget what the name is. I'm very bad at what's happening. Sometimes I don't know what is happening around me, right? especially when it comes to all of this. I have no idea. So he said, I watched ten series. So I asked him, how many episodes in each series? Ten episodes, sometimes twelve episodes. He said, so you watched? Season 1 to season 10, 10, average of 10 to 12 episodes. He has watched it in a week's time. Then he told me, next week I'm leading worship in church. Now, it's not wrong. I'm being very careful. It's not wrong. But what you could have, what we could have done, 
when you know, when you and I know, okay, I, this is something that I have to do. I'm leading worship or I'm preparing for a sermon. Is watching 10 seasons of one episode, uh, 10 seasons of some series important? I don't know how many hours he spent on that. Or reading God's word, praying, spending at least half of that time so that when you go and minister to people, leading worship, how much more effective that would be. Now, I'm not saying this is wrong. There's always a choice. I can do something else instead of that. And that's what the, the Holy Spirit does. He'll remind us. He'll tell us. But he's not going to force us. Now, the Holy Spirit has been entrusted to us to make us the bride that he wants us to be. So I feel there's a balance there. We can never be spotless on our own. Right? It's the blood of Jesus. Yet, he's preparing us to be that spotless bride. It's, it's, it's a, you know, like an oxymoron. Right? Like what uh, I think it is Paul. Paul writes and he says, when I, was it Paul or I, I think it's Exodus where, where they, the writer says, uh, when I saw the one whom you cannot see, a paradox. But anyways, that's what that's what he means, what we mean here. So right now, are we sinful? Uh, are we sinners? Yes, we, we get angry, we get upset, but we are washed by the blood of Jesus. But I should make sure that, hey, next time I should not get angry for this because God is preparing me for something. That should be the mind. Not like, okay, anyway, Jesus died on the cross. Anyway, I'll become a spotless bride, so I'll do whatever I want. No. So that balance we must maintain. Okay, we have another 10 minutes. So we'll just get into this chapter, chapter 13. We'll see how much we can do. Now, the next aspect is the local church, a house of prayer and worship. The Lord Jesus said it beautifully also, right? He says, this house is called a house of prayer. You made it a den of thieves. Uh, but let's see. Uh, as a local church, we are a royal priesthood. God, we see in both testaments, we see that God desired a people who would be his royal priesthood. Exodus 19 refers to uh, the children of Israel being royal priesthood. And in 1 Peter 2, 5, you also as living stones uh, uh, built up as a spiritual house, a royal priesthood called to offer spiritual sacrifices. Our worship and our prayer are important spiritual sacrifices that we offer to God. Look at that. Our worship and our prayer are spiritual sacrifices. The psalmist says, we give a sacrifice of praise unto the house of the Lord. When we pray, when we worship, it's a sacrifice that we are making. Right? The sacrifice to God. It's an offering up to God. Think of this. When you and I decide to pray and to worship God, the Lord Jesus is pleased. The psalmist says, he inhabits in the praises of the people. He's waiting. He's attentive to the cries of his children. Can you, can you picture these allegories? So beautiful. Imagine Jesus sitting. And uh, you know, I've always pictured it this way. He's telling the angels, hold on, hold on. Uh, stop what you're doing right now. I need to listen to what he's saying. This boy or this girl is broken. Yet he's coming to me. I need to listen. He's attentive to the cries of our heart. It's a, it's a, it's a sweet-smelling aroma in his presence. Right? Then, what is our sacrifice? Or what is our prayer? What is our wor worship? The Old Testament brings it beautifully. Uh, a perpetual fire. Uh, Leviticus chapter 6, 12 and 13. Let's read that. Leviticus 6, 12, 13. And the fire of the altar shall be kept burning, burning on it. It shall not be put out, and priest shall burn wood on it every morning, and lay the burning, burning offering in order on it. And he shall burn on it the fat of the peace of offering, 
a fire shall always be burning on the altar shall never go out right so in this portion if you read the entire passage here in leviticus the the tabernacle is built and during the inauguration of the tabernacle the brazen altar is there the fire the first fire is sent by god and then god instructs moses and aaron as well and says now this fire that i have sent needs to keep burning you got to fuel this fire i gave the first fire so you got to fuel it how do i fuel it with prayer with worship with offerings continually happening in the tabernacle right fire falls on the sacrifice but we provide the sacrifice god provides the fire same same thing happens later on uh in in first kings when elijah is standing on mount carmel and he's he's defying those 400 prophets of baal and he's saying hey maybe he's sleeping but the fire of god comes and consumes his offering because there are two different uh connotations here but the point here is we provide the sacrifice god brings the fire we do the praying we do the worship we do the reading of god's word god brings the fire the anointing of the holy spirit through that right uh god wants this to be ongoing and never ceasing very important god is not saying pray worship only on sunday morning it's an ongoing thing it's an ongoing practice i always say this do we eat once a day once a week do we eat twice a week three times a week seven days a week do we eat seven days a week do we eat three times three meals maybe some of us skip a couple of meals but most of the time we have you know three meals a day seven days a week the same way prayer worship reading of the word is not meant only for sunday morning i may sound a little bit harsh but i'm not I'm just trying to bring out a point it should be an ongoing aspect in our life okay sunday is over it's not like next sunday i open the bible next no i need to keep the altar burning paul writes he says fan it into flame we have to do it right um so we provide the sacrifice fire falls on it then we are a holy the holy incense anything offered to god must be holy and pure we must not to offer anything anyone or anything else our encounters with god take place in the midst of holiness let me give you an example in the book of ex in in the book of exodus we see in the life of moses he said god you show me your glory now moses has seen god's glory moses has seen god doing great miracles there came a point in his life he said no 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 i want to see you god says listen it's not the right time if you see me you cannot live no 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 i want to see you so god hid, hid him by the cliff and he uh, and he just made sure he just let his glory pass by we saw probably the back of jesus of god now our encounters with god take place in the midst of holiness when god encounters us we experience his holiness isaiah again says on the day uh, you know on the year when king uzziah died i saw the lord lifted up and the train of his robe filled the temple and then he said who is me i'm undone because i'm i am a man of unclean lips now isaiah could have been the most holy person during that time he was a prophet of god he may have had the closest relationship with god during that time but he says i'm a man of unclean lips so our encounters with god must take us to a place of holiness and this is the best thing in the old covenant god has the lord jesus has made us holy old covenant no new covenant he's made us holy saying this is what you are i don't feel holy doesn't matter i don't feel sanctified doesn't matter it's not your feeling it's faith right so 
even as we pursue God, we desire to become more holy. Then we look at the tabernacle of David. But what we'll do is we'll stop here because uh, from there, from this portion, we can spend more time learning about this, uh, what the tabernacle of David is and some of the important features of David's tabernacle. Right? So we'll stop here. Just put a mark there so that we know we can start from here. Right? Any questions? Everyone okay? You're able to grasp what we're doing? Yes? Right? Uh, all right. So we'll close in prayer. Before that, uh, just quickly, uh, I wasn't able to prepare for uh, ministry of the evangelist, pastor, and teacher. So the portion of rewards and responsibilities of pastor, I just need time. So today we will not have class. Um, I'll prepare for it. Sorry, I couldn't do that. But uh, I'll prepare a little more. I need to prepare some points there. And I'll prepare and maybe next class this coming Friday. Friday is our class. Yeah, Friday, we'll pick up uh, our ministry of the evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Right. So the next hour, please use it for your personal study time. And I've also posted a note on the Google Classrooms for the other students. Right. Okay, let's pray and close. Would anyone like to pray? Close? Go ahead. Heavenly Father, so thank you, Jesus, this teaching. Your Holy Spirit help us as everyone of the teaching and the uh, meditation of the focus on your word. And God, thank you, though, everyone, give your wisdom, knowledge, understanding. Yes, Father, we are. Father, thank you, Jesus, Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you, everyone. I'll see you on Friday. God bless.